How's everybody doing? Welcome to another show of No Ideas Original Sports. I'm Kiyata. I'm here with Reem and Theo. How y'all doing this week? All is good, brother. All right, that's good. We had, a, we had a good week in sports this week. I just want to start off with revisiting the Super Bowl. Hmm. I think we all kind of lost. We were going for the, the Chiefs and Theo was going for whoever's against Tom Brady. <laughs> so we all kind of lost on that one. I mean, I was just surprised by how bad a beat was, but that, that was surprising to me. Yeah, I mean, I, I predicted the Chiefs would win, but at the same time, I'm not completely surprised that the Bucks won. But like you said, I'm surprised by the, the beating that uh, – that the Chiefs took. I mean, they not only did they lock down Hill, they locked down Kelsey, they locked down everybody you could think of. <laughs> you know, it was pretty bad. I wasn't expecting that. I thought uh, Kansas City would win in a in a high scoring game, like a close game. Or if anything, I thought worst case scenario in terms of predictions that the Bucks would win, but in a high scoring game. But to see the Chiefs just get pretty much dominated. I don't know. It's, a, it's almost a bit concerning because is it one of those things where the Chiefs got exposed or was it just they completely got out coached? A little bit of both? I don't know. What do you think, Theo? Uh, uh, the win of the game was not so surprising either way. Um, I was more disappointed in Andrew Reid, who um, made no adjustments. He was at the interview that Philadelphia made no adjustments, you know, missing two or three linemen. You help on protection, and you just, you know, get, get my home, no tight end help, tight end protection. You don't go big, nothing like, nothing of the sort. No contest at all. I bet he thought that his team was so talented. It was just, you know, I bet he just click it on and, and overcome the Buccaneers defense, which didn't happen. So I really been in the week not adjusting to help his O line protect better, you know, not giving what the, uh, was giving it, which is the one game. They're playing a couple two shells, so we all see that. You know, the up four was rushing so well. Um, but give Bucket his credit, man. They was they was it was on point, they was clicking. But the in the two time when Mahomes did have um time to pass the ball, nobody was open. I mean it wasn't open, they were dropping the ball. That's true. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Now, you know, it's funny. I thought it would be the opposite. I, I thought that um it would be a high-scoring game. I thought that the Bucks receivers would be the ones dropping the balls. I mean, you even had um Kelsey drop a first down play that was that was a key play for them moving the ball. And the offensive line was just terrible. So we, we'll have to see if they can show up that line and get, like you said, I think you mentioned it last week, Theo, about the running game or something, which never happened or something. Yeah. We'll have to see about the Chiefs next year. One thing I, I would like to see him do more of is maybe throw a couple of screen passes, but I guess it's hard to throw screen passes when they don't have to respect the running game, right? So you can't really throw a screen or a play action pass. Um, yeah, the, the Chiefs, they, they have their work cut out for them in the offseason. I think they'll still be a good team, but I'm sure other teams are watching too. The, the, the film is out there now on what you do to attempt to beat them, but – does every team have the personnel of the Bucks in order to execute it? Right. Um, I got a few things I, I need to say, I need to address. Is, um, okay, number one, it, I'm amazed how a head coach who's known for having a, a, a screen heavy uh, playbook, there's no, there's no screen at all throughout the entire game. Yeah. I'm puzzled, I'm puzzled by that. That's number one. Okay, number two. Is Tariq Hill exposed? Because all he does is outrun you, whether it's a deep post or a slant or a, a or a reverse some kind. Where was his right running tree at to get open the entire game? He yeah. showed no route running tree whatsoever that entire game, let alone his career. Okay. You're right. I mean about that. Everything, Tyreek, everything is going to outrun you, whether it's a, a, a streak, deep post, shallow post, drag, slant. That's it. And that was on lock. Did he adjust? No, he didn't adjust. So did he get exposed as far as his um, creativity to get open besides 
do a deep pose, a shallow pose for a screen. I mean, a, 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 a drag or snap. I see a, like a few players where they attempt to, to run like a reverse to get Hill, just get the ball in his hands. Thought they had a little bit of success with it, but not too much. Um, but yeah, uh, the Bucks definitely, definitely shocked me in the fashion that they won for sure. I, I, I wouldn't be surprised to see them go after another receiver because, you know, between what you're saying again about Hill with the route running, the other guys didn't really do anything. And Watson, uh, Sammy Watkins was hurt. So they'll probably, I wouldn't be surprised if they were looking for another receiver, for a number two receiver, some kind of a possession receiver, somebody to help them move the chains, like you said, that could run the routes and stuff like that. So I, I could definitely see him doing that because I was watching the game and I'm like, similar to what you're saying is that they only, they, you featuring the tight end and the speedy, basically the deep receiver. There's no possession. I didn't see any possession receiver on the other side to be able to, you know, to move the chains. Right. So that that's definitely something that, that that's a concern. So this week, um, you know, more Texans drama. J.J. Watt asked out of, out of the Texans, and they gave him his release, basically. I mean, I, I think there'll be a lot of opportunities for him. You, do we think J.J. Watt has a lot left in the tank, or what do we think about the Texans situation? What's going on, and what's him in you? I mean, I'm not surprised that he asked out. Like you said, it's, it's a bit of a mess over there right now. I think he still has some uh, – some uh, left in the tank, some gas in there, if you if you will. But <clears throat> if I'm him, I, I would probably potentially consider uh, consider retiring, unless you can latch on with a contender. Maybe the even though they don't necessarily need him, but maybe the Chiefs or you know somebody Green Bay, somebody who's definitely a contender, you latch on with them and try to get a ring out of it. But other than that, um, I, I say he call, he needs to call it a career. Um, personally, not because he's finished, but he, he had a successful career. Walk away while you're still relatively healthy, I guess. Um, unless you, again, can get on with a contender and make a, a championship run. Uh, I think he has more left in the tank. Um, I don't think he can play 50 snaps. Like he's saying that in his prime, but, you know, maybe 30, 35, 40 tops by the game. With the right fit, right team, maybe that team just had the record. We just said, <clears throat> on the for sure, with his brother, he got a good defense as well. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Maybe, maybe, maybe the Buccaneers, you never know. You know, Buccaneers, they keep a good fit over there too as well. But if, um, if, he, if he's willing to uh, accept, I guess, a reduced role, so to speak, as far as Scott's concerned, he has nothing to prove. You know, he's played by the Hall of Fame, he's been great with his career. So there's nothing to prove to see the I think have 60 snaps, but uh, they did 40 snaps per game. Right fit, right team, who's there? I can see that happening. Yeah, I, I, I've, I've heard that the, the Browns, the Steelers, and the Bills are like some primary teams, and Tennessee falls shown interest. I mean, the Steelers, like you said, Kareem, would be ideal just because it's a good story because TJ's there and what's up I'm seeing, um, Derek's there too, so both of his brothers play for the Steelers. So that would be kind of like a feel-good story. I don't know if they're ready to be a Super Bowl contender. But, I mean, you got the Bills, who was him, who, who moving forward. You got the Browns. Well, we don't know which Browns team is going to show up from year to year. But <laughs> you got the you got the Bills, you know, that they could probably use them too. And Tennessee, they definitely need a pass rush. I don't think it worked out too well bringing it on Clowney this year. But I think they, they – I don't know how many sacks he had, but we didn't hear too much about Clowney's pass rush in this year, so. I'm sure they'll be in the market for for another another pass register. So we we had a big trade where we had, which we usually don't have. We had a, a swap of quarterbacks where we had Matthew Stafford go to Detroit and Jared Goff go to the Rams. Do we think that Matthew Stafford is enough to to get the the Rams back in the Super Bowl conversation? Mm, I personally don't. Um... I mean, I, I would say he's a good quarterback, um, but how much better than golf is he, you know? Plus, I know he's had um, some injury concerns here and there, but I guess playing the quarterback position, who hasn't? But when you consider how much they gave up just to get him, too, you know, 
I, I think the Rams uh, probably lost that trade. They gave up a lot to Detroit. They gave up, a, a to me, a, a quality quarterback as well as multiple picks, et cetera. And, I, again, I think he's a good quarterback, Stafford, but I don't know if he's that guy that pushes you over the edge. Um, I think he's almost the same as, as golf, to be honest with you. So it may be a lateral move, I think. I think he's an upgrade. I think he is uh, more accurate. He is definitely more tougher of the two. He's hurt. Um, I think him being around better talent than he has Detroit would be an asset too as well. And um, plus the Rams run football too as well. So them having, I guess, a one game mentality will help him, I guess, curve his um, attempts. Unlike uh, Detroit, he's going the ball 50 times a game. So they had to for them to, for them to, for them to win, as I should say. So um, the Rams, maybe 30 attempts per game, 25 per game. Because Rams are supposed to run the football as well. They have great defense. They are ready, they are ready to win the team right now. And, um, I'm quite sure uh, they don't go that far. At least they'll go at least to, I guess, the uh, NFC Championship at least. I mean, I, I look at it like this. I think that um... – Cooper Cup and Woods are good receivers. I think that um, Van Jefferson's going to have to step up, the guy they drafted this year, because, I mean, although I like those two guys, I mean, I don't really see either one of them as being, I mean, maybe maybe a low-tier number one receiver, but I don't really see Woods or Cup as number one receivers. I don't know if Van Jefferson is either. You might have a bunch of twos, but they'll need to, need to improve that. Stafford definitely has a much better arm than Goff. That's 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 the truth, and and the running game, and I think the the offensive line is probably better too. And he would, I think Detroit. Listen, I think Detroit basically for them is just a money. Seems like a money dump and try to rebuild situation. I actually wouldn't be surprised if if at some point down the line in a year or two they just ate the rest of that golf contract, and if they still drafted a quarterback in this draft, because I don't think they see golf as the long term future for them, but. I think Stafford's an upgrade. I just think that even if you upgrade the quarterback, you got a guy that could throw the ball further and maybe, you know, more accurately. Do you have enough weapons around them, you know, as far as the passing game to get it? The tight end is pretty good, and you got two receivers, and they drafted a guy. So I don't know what the, the receiver depth is like on there. But the, the play calling is usually generally good. I'm sure it'll probably open up a little more because I don't think they, did, you know, tried as many plays that they'll try with Stafford that with golf. So yeah, I would say uh, like McVay is pretty good in terms of you know, head coach. He's creative, um, so he may get get better production out of Stafford. Like you say, his usage rate should be down uh, compared to Detroit, where he was throwing the ball. Like you said, fifty times, whatever it is. The only thing I would say is with a guy that's throwing that much. Granted, he didn't have maybe the best weapons, but a guy throwing that much, he should be lead, leading the league in in yardage, shouldn't he? He was up there. I mean, I his receivers. But you throwing the ball fifty times. You should, you should be, you know, definitely at the the top of the list. To his credit, he had two two thousand yard receivers. So that that was and that worked out for him. He did. He was up there, but I think like like Theo said, or you you might have said, he was he was injured a lot too. I think he missed quite a few games this year too. That's the yeah, and that's the concern I have with him but his durability but you could make that claim probably about most quarterbacks in the league um, all it takes is that one hit yeah. so the NFL this week we had the Hall of Fame inductees again around the Super Bowl time this was a big week we put Megatron in we got Drew Pearson Charles Woodson Alan Fanica and John Lynch um I'm I'm good with all of those guys. I mean, they, you know, they all seem to have seem accomplished a lot in their career. Pretty accomplished standouts. I mean, Megatron. It was to me. I, I was his, his. I think his whole his whole demeanor with being fed up with Detroit, similar to Barry Sanders. You know, I, I would have loved to see him be on another team or play more years. You know, man, same thing with Barry Sanders. That the, the Lions kind of wear it out, wear it out of you. And then both those guys, from what I understand. The team refused to trade him, so that was that issue. Drew Pearson, Theo's got to know about that. That's a cowboy, 
right there. So that's one of Theo's guys. Charles Woodson, I mean, he's, hey, I remember Charles Woodson with the rose on the rose in his mouth on the cup of Michigan. There. So, Banneker, offensive line, which we know we know about him, man, in it for years. And John Lynch, we know, we definitely know about him in that back was out there and, um, with the DB. So, I'm, I'm fine with those guys. What do you think? Yeah, I would agree. I'm fine with all of those selections. I'm probably the happiest for Megatron, though, seeing him get in just for the fact that he pretty much suffered all those years in Detroit, right? Like you said, Detroit has a way of seemingly sucking the life out of players. So I'm probably the happiest for Megatron, but I don't disagree with any of the selections. I would say they, they, they're all deserving, you know? Yeah, I agree. No issues over here. They're all deserving. They've all been great. Uh, I think Drew Pinch should have been in many years ago. Me, honestly, um, Charles Wilson has been great as a cornerback. All safety has been great. It really just went. Uh, Alan Fanica has been a dominant old lineman. John Lynch has been great. I think Buccaneers is a Super Bowl champion. You know, so, I mean, everybody on this, like, like uh, Kenyatta said, is, is deserving. It should be, uh, it should be in there as well. The new pitch should have been, been there many years ago outside of that. This was there. This was one time I think they got it right. I mean, every you know, every once in a while we'll look at a list and be like, wait a minute, how's this guy getting getting in there? Or does he deserve it? But these guys seem like they they were saying they really deserve it. So this week in the NBA, we had a we had a trade where the Knicks got brought in Derrick Rose. So basically he was saying for well, what I would amount to be nothing. <laughs> so I mean, I personally think it's a great trade. I've been a fan of Derrick Rose all the way through. I'm on the Derrick, Derrick Rose's biggest fan. And I, I think he still has a lot in the tank. I think he has a lot to offer offer the team as far as, like, working with Tibbs, how the Tibbs system, and just overall leadership of guys, like, quickly and stuff like that. I mean, I know both you guys, which I both you guys probably have a lot more insight into what you guys think, you know, Derrick Rose will mean to the Knicks. I mean, I'm I'm excited about it for the reasons uh, you just mentioned. Mentoring, I think Derrick Rose still has some game left too. He's not, you know, just there to, to mentor. I think he can still play. Um, I guess one of the somewhat concerns is whose minutes does he take away? Just based on what we've seen so far, Austin Rivers kind of seems like the odd man out of the rotation so far. Me personally, I would probably like to see that even though he's been playing well the last few games, I would probably like to see that odd man out as Alfred Payton. <laughs> I'm not a fan of his, but he has played well over the last few games. But Derek Rose, um, like you said, I think he'll be a good mentor to the young guys, Toppin, Quickly, uh, Barrett, playing within Tibbs' system. And I think he still has game left. Can he play 40 minutes and carry a team? Probably not. But I think he can give you a good 25 minutes or so uh, of quality production scoring off the bench. Um, So I'm excited about it, especially the fact that we didn't give up much. We gave up a second rounder, Dennis Smith Jr., who wasn't in the rotation. The Knicks, Tibbs had no, you know, plans to include him in the rotation. So it's a good trade, I think. I'm excited for it. Great trade by the Knicks. Give them nothing. Give them back their own draft pick. So far, <laughs> his first, his first, what, his first two games, he's been very impactful. Come off the bench. And uh, his former coach, when he came, he said that um, he wanted to come to New York. So that's good right there. But so I guess his mindset is different than, than his first time coming out here. I guess he came the first time. I think I think he wasn't ready as far as like, his body wasn't ready yet. You could tell he had a lot of ups and downs first first in New York. You know, like, trying, to get, trying to get his legs back together, I guess. I'm um, going we'll to get through injuries. I think was told. And now that we see uh, three years after injury, he's right, tight in shape, and legs together, you know, so, and we see more of uh, so-called old day rolls from Chaka Bull days, for sure. So he um, looks good. You see him shoot jump shots. and maybe going in. I'm well, like, I guess, you know, in the Bulls, he's more, more like a sticky shooter, but uh, it's more consistent now than what I've seen in the past. So explosive, still, still go by people, you know, and uh, – Seems like he has a more team-oriented mentality now. Back in New York. Plus, uh, 
You, you raised a good point when you mentioned his body wasn't ready. And the first thing I thought of when you mentioned that is, is uh, I don't think his mind was ready either. Because if you remember during that season, he kind of went on like a mental break. Remember, he stepped away. Right. And right. They, could, right. they didn't yeah. even know where he was for a little while there. Um, he thought about retiring. So yeah. I don't think his mindset was ready either. I remember at the start of that season, they were kind of like billed to be like, hey, we got our own big three, right? Me, Carmelo, Chris Stapps, right, was new. But yeah, I don't think his mind was ready either. And I remember watching something after the fact where he was speaking and he, he made some comments where he said he realized a couple of games into the season that the team was basically shit, that the team wasn't as good as he anticipated. So from there, uh, throughout the rest of the season, I think he pretty much checked out. Yeah, like they weren't as good as they were billed to be, and like you said, physically he was a different player, and mentally he was different. But this time around, I think he appreciates it a little more. His body is ready. I think now he's not trying to go over top, you know, and dunk on everybody, and he's kind of matured out of that. So another thing to consider too is you have a former MVP who still has something left in the tank going against second unit guys. You know, so that's adding to his his production as well, because the guy can still play former MVP going against a team's backup point guard or backup shooting guard. I mean, I can, I can tell you what I think is going to happen. I mean, for me, I think eventually they will get rid of Alfred Payton. They'll probably move him. But I don't think quickly will be the starter. I think Rose will be the starter. One thing just from watching the games that was saying, I think Quigley eventually become the starter. But one thing from watching the games, even when I'm coming off the bench, and this is what you guys have been talking about all season. The pace is different. The pace of the game is different when Derrick Rose is on the court. Toppin actually looks like a much better player when he plays with Derrick Rose. Robinson looks like a better player when he plays with Derrick Rose. The one thing that Derrick Rose does is he takes guys off the dribble really easily. So the defense sucks into him. So he's able to kick the ball to these guys for dunks, throw oops and things like that, and get the other guys easier shots and, and baskets, I think think he'll be able to help Quigley along learning how to get that part of the game going because we all know Quigley can get into the paint and score and stuff like that. It's the it's the other parts where you start getting the other people involved and get helping them become better players too. Yeah, what well, I think he's going to do for Quigley, and this uh, is ironic, is tell Quigley to slow down a little bit. <laughs> so I think Quigley uh, – and it's – it's to be expected, right? He's a rookie, but I think he's moving a little bit too fast. Same with Toppin. If you if you look at these guys, they're out there playing extremely frantic. So I think Derrick Rose is going to get them to slow down, right, relax, and, and let the game come to you. That's yeah. one of the things I think he'll do. Alfred Payton is kind of sort of has that because he, he's a veteran. But at the same time, Alfred Payton kills him because he has – no perimeter game, and he just plays at too slow of a pace, I think. Yeah. Uh, I don't think their roster is built to play at that pace. I think, you know, what, what what they did was smart. They went out and they got a couple of guys that, like, Quigley can shoot. We know Burks can shoot. We know Bullock can shoot. RJ's, everybody, to some extent, has approved their shooting. Randall can shoot somewhat. So if you get a guy that's running down the court, you get these guys some open looks during the game. They can launch those threes and stuff like that. But when you deliberately pound it down, the defense gets back. They get settled in and stuff like that. You get deep into the shot clock. So the shots don't look as good. Whereas with say, somebody that, that can get them in, like I hadn't seen and prior to this week, I hadn't seen Toppin look as well as he looked in a long time. Was it? He looked really good out there with Rose or something. Okay, yeah, with Rose, you mentioned it earlier, is Rose can actually break – the defense down without the need for a pick. You know, yeah. he can pick his man down off the dribble. And just by doing something that basic, it opens it up for all of those guys, you know. Now you have to converge on Rose getting into the paint, and he's dumping off to Robinson. He's dumping off to, to Obi Toppin. Um, speaking of Robinson, unfortunately, he's out right yeah. now. Broken hand, um, four to six weeks. But yeah, Derrick Rose is gonna he's gonna add value. I don't think he's necessarily gonna lock, like you said, I could see him maybe starting eventually, but I don't think he's gonna lock heavy minutes. But I think he'll he'll be in to probably eventually start the game. And I wouldn't be surprised if he's out there to finish the game as well. Yeah. 
because Thibs, you know, Thibs trust him. It's good to see Rose Byron into the system that he already knows. First thing he did was have dinner with uh, OB and I- IQ. And so, listen, I'm here for you guys, man, to be a mentor. So, I'm, I'm, good, I'm, good. I'm glad to hear that and see that in Dead Rose, the bond to the team, and be there mentor for young kids coming up who are the future for the Knicks. You know, like, like you guys said, man, you know, it's good to have a guard who can break down the offense, his own shot, make guys better. So far, the, the three teams, three, uh, games we saw so far, the two games so far, we've shown that. Yeah. So, moving on to talking about guys that are making teams better and stuff. Right now, we got the, the MVP race. Um, obviously, we got to look at we got to look at the usual characters. We got LeBron always in the mix. Um, I would say Steph is kind of you know in the mix there. He's got to be in the mix. I mean, KD. I would say even yeah, even though he missed the week, KD. Well, even by missing a week, he showed more even more why he probably is in the MVP competition. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, um. I, I think Luca, Luca's definitely in the, com- the conversation, and and some of the, you know there's other guys that that are on the fringe. I mean, I wouldn't say that he's quite there yet. I mean, you look at a guy like Donovan Mitchell. I'm sorry, I almost forgot Jokic, who they're winning, so he's definitely in the conversation. Yeah. But talking to Theo this week, he brought up an interesting point. Does the MVP have to come from a winning team? I personally don't think so. Um, it typically does. I think that adds to it. Like if it's a close race between somebody that's on a, a winning team versus a losing team, I think the edge probably goes to the guy on the winning team. Um, I'm sure I forgot Joel and B too. I don't want to leave him out. He might search me down and, and send me some message in the in Instagram. So you can't leave Joel and B out. Yeah, that, he's he's definitely another guy. Another guy who's I guess on the outside looking in, I don't see him necessarily winning it a third time would be Giannis, right? It's hard to completely leave him off the list, but I don't see him winning it because um, the Bucs seem to have regressed. But, yeah, I, I think MVP can come from a, a losing team, but it, it can't be one of those things where um, the team is just extremely bad. They're terrible, you know. If they're competitive, um, I don't see any reason why, why not. But, again, whoever's on that losing team, I think has to have uh, like hands down numbers that are better than guys on winning teams. I mean, and I forgot another guy. Um, you got Dame Lillard. And and when we talk about guys on losing teams, I mean, we got to, we got to talk about Bradley Bilder too. Yeah. Um, he falls into the category where I was saying his team is just extremely bad, but it's hard to deny the guy's numbers, you know, yeah, I don't like to uh, discredit uh, a guy who's who's the greatest player in, on a bad situation. It's kind of unfair, you know. So a guy comes up every day. Um, he's he's, he's born out trying to carry the team that he's that he, he can or she can. So I don't want to do that against him. Um, but I do understand both ways, you know. You know, like like LeBron or or Joker got the same great. So if LeBron and Joker have the same stats as uh, Steph Curry. You have a better record, then I understand that as well. Yeah. But like, yeah. So like uh, Westbrook, for example, you know, he won because he, he was doing triple doubles for a whole season. Yeah. Yeah. I, so I see that why he won it. If he, didn't, if he wasn't doing that, I don't think he won the, won the award, honestly. But he yeah. made a, a, a great achievement in doing triple doubles. So that's, this is why he won that. But, um, now, I don't believe in uh, discrediting a guy or knocking a guy down because he's playing on a bad team. You know, he's great. I don't believe that. Yeah, because I think the MVP, what, what ends up happening is that your wins are not always tied to your own individual performance. I mean, you look at the talent around some of these guys, and I mean, all the guys that we basically said that the main guys, they have a lot of talent around them. You know, the, well, LeBr- you know, the LeBrons, the KDs, was him joking? He's got talent around him. I mean, Luca, Luca to some extent, he has some talent around him. I mean, these guys all have somewhat. I mean, a guy like Bradley Bill. I mean, you got Westbrook, and I, and I mean, Westbrook is who he is, and stuff. You either love him or you hate him. As he, you know, and Joel Embiid, he seems to have like they seem to have found the right formula, the guys to bring in there. So. 
the talent level you have around you, pushing with it, that's the, I mean, we're not giving an MVP award to the GM. Right. Man. Good point. Good point. Okay. So uh, another thing that came up was that I think it kind of slipped under the radar. And most people didn't notice the Mavs hadn't been playing the anthem all throughout the whole season. So when it first came up, I thought it was just, you know, an isolated thing. I didn't know it was the whole season. Again, eventually, the NBA put out a statement saying that it's almost required that so they went back and playing it. But Mark Cuban's reasoning was that he talked to his players and he talked to the people in the community, and they didn't feel like that uh, the anthem represented them. What do you guys think of that? Like you said, I I, I thought it was an isolated uh, thing. I didn't realize it was the entire season. But I like the idea behind it. I mean, Mark Cuban is one of those owners that at least uh, he comes across as being all about the community, all about his team. Um, so I, I, I like the idea of it. Um, I certainly don't have a problem with it. The anthem never did represent the community in the first place. And that being said, it's a monetary thing. This is why over before him want to be played before the game. It's all about the money. Yeah. It's all about the money. Because you guys getting paid to, I guess, the government sort of state. Mm-hmm. All the game. So it's all about the money. But the answer has never been about, you know, the, uh, our own neighborhood sort of state, the Latin neighborhood, that neighborhood. And it was about that. No. I mean, you, you figure they're not doing the anthem and they play in American Airlines Arena. So, again, the, the, again, you know, like you said, the money, you, you got sponsors. I'm, I'm pretty much sure those American Airlines people probably didn't know either until it came, to, you know, in the light. So you can start getting sponsorship pressure and all types of other stuff. And then, like, anytime the NBA is getting involved, like you said, you know, you know it's a money thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely. In 12 games, a lot of games to not notice that as well. Come on, now. I mean, like, ooh, yeah. three, let's say five games. It's all about 12 games. On, yeah. <laughs> so this week, Kevin Garnett made some comments saying that players from 20 and 30 years ago couldn't play in this era. I mean, for me, I, I definitely disagree with that. I, I 100% disagree with that. I think the only thing that I think that would be hard I think it would be extremely hard to play defense in this era because we're saying 20, 30 years ago, you could put your hands on some people. I mean, some of these guys, when you hear the older guys talk about how much they score and they say these astronomical numbers, it has nothing to do with people sliding their feet. It has everything to do with people's ability to grab them and tug them, put their hands on them and manipulate them that way. So I, I couldn't see many, at least, I don't know about the regular role player because the guys are more athletic now, you know, bigger, stronger, faster. But I couldn't see one star player that couldn't come into the league right now and be just as good as, as what they were. Yeah, because, I mean, you could say the same thing in in the reverse, right? Imagine having to defend Jordan where you can't touch him. You know, you can't put your hand on him. Jordan would average 60 points, you know? Imagine having to defend Charles Barkley down low where you can't hand check him, right? You can't put that arm on him to keep him, call him alone, right? So you you can make the case the opposite way around as well. Like you said, I don't know about the average uh, NBA player, but the superstars, what was Shaquille O'Neal average? Six? Yeah, you could. <laughs> you could. <laughs> you put your arm on him and bump him down low? How, how do you stop him? You know, so the same thing applies for the superstars, from that era, you throw them into this era, I think those guys would probably dominate even more. Um, like you said, de- defensively, they would be just like everybody else, maybe struggle a little bit, depending on who they're guarding, who the matchups are. Would Jordan be able to shut almost every two guard down? Who knows, right? Without being able to hand check, get physical. Um, same thing with Isaiah Thomas. You go down the list, right? But I think those guys would definitely still be who they were, if not better, in terms of point production and scoring in, in this era. Imagine Magic Johnson throwing the ball, throwing a pass to somebody, and and Worthy not having to worry about getting clothesline. <laughs> you know how many assists would Magic average? 20? Yeah. 25? Yeah. Right? Those guys were missing dunks and layups because they 
as Kurt Ramis, right? <laughs> you Teams know? used to have enforcers. <laughs> exactly. So now you don't have to worry about Rick Mahorn down there taking your head off or Bill Lambeard. What, what would they do? You know, they would. So I, I think it goes both ways. I respect Kevin Garnett's opinion a lot of times, but I think uh, in this particular instance, he was probably a, a little uh, a little out of line. Um, I think he's probably just caught up in a moment, if I had to guess. Um, but yeah, the stars would still be stars and probably even better in this era, I would say. Fellas, I want you guys to take I want three minutes of your attention. <laughs> I want both you guys to say yes or no. That's it, okay? Okay. Yeah. It, it, it pertains to can these guys play in this era? So I'm going to be not. I'm going to say, you know, the Isaiahs and Magic. Okay? I'm going to give a random name. You just to know can play in this era, okay? Okay. About 10 names. Screw well. Yes. Yes. Alan Houston. Yes. Yes. Michael Finley. Yes. Yes. Jason Richardson. Yes. Yes. Mitch Richardson. Yes. <laughs> For him, KJ. So, yeah. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to go, I'm go eight, 10, 8. I'm going down below a little bit. KJ, I'm almost done. Yeah, Kevin Jones. Yeah. 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 Nick Van Axel. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Rob Strickland. Oh, yeah. Yeah, easily. Marbury. Oh, he would kill. Yeah. Marbury, I was 30. I got three more for you. Abdul Raouf. Yep. Yep. Chris Bubba. The original, the original Steph Curry, you mean? <laughs> <laughs> I'm naming so called, I guess, second tier Not, guys. Yeah, I, tier guys Who would kill? I could go on and yeah. on. Who would kill in this league? They would. I go on and on. And what is KG talking about here? Are you all of those guys, me? yeah. Come on, There's no and way they could. And mind you, these guys was killing KG when they were in the back end of their careers. Yeah. They was killing yeah, KG. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> you got any problems when I come in here in, in a no hair tech era, no suplex era? I was doing suplex in the 80s, yeah. man, and 90s, man. You imagine if these guys got all this for the guys you just named got the freedom to take those shots, all them shooters you named, and, and with some guys taking people. <laughs> fellas, the whole league is scoring over 120 per game. Everybody, even the Knicks. Yeah, yeah. They're yeah. scoring 110 or more, 120 or more. You guys yeah. will kill in the league. Yeah, I, I think he's way he's, off on this he's, one. He's, 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 he's wild out. I love KD. I don't know. Yeah. He's wild out. That's it. He wild I out. Mean, even if you look at the reverse, don't get me wrong. I don't think they all could, but I would tell you there are players that's just universal. I think LeBron would be LeBron anytime you drop. Him. LeBron would be LeBron. I think guys, I think KD would be fine just because you don't have guys like that. Like you don't have you don't have guys that's that tall that just that skill that can do that stuff. But I think it's less people that translate now to years ago than the reverse. Yeah, because they can't handle the physicality. Yeah. A lot of those guys. Yeah. You know? Um but yeah, KG is I mean, I guess they must have they must have talked them into that one. I would <laughs> I would have loved to see him do that have that conversation with somebody like like a Spreewell or like Baron Davis or one of them when they would have been laughing at him or something. Hey, can't have on my list, Baron Davis. And I can use Baron Davis. He's automatic. I know he's yeah. killer. He, he no, said it, himself, Baron Davis. Come on, man. Yeah, they would those guys they would they would kill. You you can't even imagine imagine the golden age of centers like Kareem said, you got Shaq. What would Elijah Warren Robinson and Ewan do? <laughs> With no hand checking. Listen, we can't hand check you, we can't bump you in the back. Alonzo morning with no hand checking. <laughs> Come on, man. No bumping. Come on, man. Yeah, Del yeah, Curry yeah. will be an assassin right now in this league. Del Curry, <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> with his jump shot. Come on, they get ready. Come on, Del Curry will be crazy. This league, he would be yeah, all day. Yeah. He would literally. He probably would be a max player in this league. He would be a max player because he would score thirty points. He'd be appropriate he seven threes a game. Thank you. Yeah, he would be a max player. Some of those guys, you get them in good enough shape, they probably could come back and play now. <laughs> 
<laughs> it's probably people right now like, damn, I wish I was <laughs> I was still playing. I'm sure they are. Mm-hmm. There's mm-hmm. some guys like, man, you see Jared Jack's trying to get back in the game. He like, wait a minute. So now they don't let you touch guards no more. <laughs> so, I, I saw him, man. I saw him in the G League trying to do his thing, man. I wasn't yeah, mad at him right there. Well, you figure they, think about it. They can't hand check him no more. I right. think uh, I think KD, uh, KG would have been better off maybe going like one era back. Yeah. Like maybe talking about Clyde Frazier and those guys. And even some of those guys were killed. But I think he would have been better off making the case there. Yeah, exactly. that era, maybe. You know, Will Chamberlain, <laughs> Will Chamberlain <laughs> might have averaged a hundred in this. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Kind of archer ball, put the people on his back. You <laughs> mm. Playing against these guys. Yeah, I, I think KG. Uh, yeah, I think he just got caught up in the moment. Yeah, I, I, I think so. They probably was looking at him like, uh, man, I think you. It's probably people sitting at home laughing. I can imagine that. Yeah, you even think about uh, Clyde Drexler, right? Gary yeah. Payton, Sean Kent. You, you go on and on. Mm-hmm. I mean, you it's, think about it this way. Reggie Miller's definitely a max player in this. Reggie Miller would be a max player. Imagine Chris, Chris Webber no hand checking. Right. Yeah. There's all types of people. I mean, there's people... Even guys, you Andre Karolinko with no hand checking and none of that stuff. <laughs> <laughs> you can start naming anybody down the road. Basically, the only guys that could get stopped is the guys who didn't play, the guys on the bench. Yeah, I think KG I was a bit, bit out of line on that one. Think about it this way. They had to change the rules because Mark Jackson was back and guards are down in that era. What would he do this era? Yeah, that's that's why they created the five second rule, right? He was yeah. posting up for fifteen seconds. What would what would these guards do with Mark Jackson? Move out of the way. Yeah, he could. Yeah, that's what they did. They move out. Now move out, move out the way. <laughs> the guy score and come back and try to score on on the other end. Yeah, that's exactly what happened. Yeah, that that question was crazy. Hey. From watching the games, I mean, this week or something, and through his own admission, it looks like Kimba's not himself, man. I, I, for me, I, I'm hoping that it's, it's still a little bit of lingering this from the knee injury. He's saying it's not, but he definitely does not look like himself. I think a part of it is uh, the, the lingering. Like you said, maybe the knee, maybe he's not being 100% honest there. And then part of it that the lingering issue is probably playing with uh with Tatum and Brown. Those guys are good, but it's it's difficult when you're a guy like Kimba who's used to having that ball in his hands, and those guys create shots for themselves. So now your job is pretty much bring the ball up the court, give it to Tatum, and then go sit in the corner and watch. You know, and that's not Kimba's game. Kimba needs the ball in his hands. Heavy pick and roll offense. Like Kimba, uh, a healthy Kimba, that is, would have been good on the Knicks, right? Because that's what the Knicks need, a guy who could break the defense down. Boston, not so much. Boston just needs a serviceable point guard, which is why uh, Jeff Teague or whoever it is, that's not their their biggest issue. Um, So I think that's probably what's affecting Kimba's game more than anything. And going back a step further, I think that's probably why uh, Kyrie wanted to get out of there too. Um, among other things, I think he sensed that Jason uh, Tatum and, and Jalen Brown didn't necessarily need him. You know, he couldn't run the offense the way he was accustomed to with the ball in his hands. So I think Kimba is just feeling the effects of that. Kimba kind of been an injury prone his whole career. If you think about it, he always been injured for the majority of his career. Um, I think the knee injury was kind of substantial. I think he needed more time to uh, rehab. Maybe he rushed a little bit. Um, it kind of affected the team from the start of the season. I guess they tried to force him in the start lineup. He took a lot of game-winning game, I guess, winning shots, so to speak. And uh, he didn't come through. Um, sometimes the injuries, you need two years to, to recoup. Yep. Or a year and a half. No matter what sport it is. Mm-hmm. Um, that being said, um, I'm a Kemba, Kemba Walker fan. Uh, I like him a lot. It was since UConn days. Um, 
But sometimes, you know, injuries do pile up and take effect, and, you know, he could be headed towards his uh, back end of his career on a downslide. Never know. I hope not, but uh, it seems that way so far. Yeah, I, I think I think it's a combination of both. I think you're right, Theo. Like, he, he needed way more time than what he got to get back in the game. Plus, too, it is a combination of that. His game is like, some teams you got to know your personnel. And the one thing I give this, the good thing I give the Celtics is they know that the future is with Tatum and Brown. That's the young guy. That's where the future is. Bringing a guy like Kimber, they tried to build a big three, but what they need really is a defensive point guard who can spot up and shoot three points. That type of guy, something like that, where where they don't need the ball in their hand. They can just go to the corner, you know, go stand in the corner type of guy. You can't really have a ball dominant guy when you've got two guys that's ball dominant. And when Marcus Smart comes, he's just as ball dominant too. So and I don't think Kemba's personality is such that he goes out there and kind of like asserts himself in a way to say, okay, no, I'm doing it. He kind of tries to go with the flow. I think on Charlotte, because he, you know, because of the, the quality of the team, they pretty much had no choice but to, you know, like listen, default to Kemba, like listen. We don't have the players. We can't go and tell this guy that he shouldn't have the ball. So, listen, we just going, you know, he has the ball, and when he gives it to us, we just got to be ready. Whereas he's in the position now where he's got to be the guy that's got to be ready to take the shot. And that's just not not who he's at. Usually, you don't get to, like you, like you said, that's usually when you're on the back end of your career, when you're on the backslide, when you become that guy that's like the, the addition of something like the, the difference would be like Ray Allen in the beginning of career towards the end. In the beginning of Ray Allen's career, he had the ball in his hand. Towards the end, Ray Allen was spot up. He would catch it and he would shoot. He was just having to be great at doing it. But I don't think Kemba, at least physically his body may be at that point, but I think in his mind and his ability, he's not at that point where he feels he's a spot up to the guy waiting for the shot. So It's going to be interesting to see how it goes. We From one point guard to another one, we got um Kyle Lowry. When I watched the game, the Toronto games, I mean, we all see what Fred Van Fleet can do. <laughs> I mean, oh, and, and he 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 clearly is the better of the two right now. I mean, he, that's not even not even close. I mean, to to take his minutes away and try to balance it out, like right? they got them both out there at the same time. And even when you look at Norman Powell, I think the backcourt of Norman Powell and Van Fleet is probably the best backcourt option they have. Yeah, I mean, is it time for Kyle Lowry for them to trade Kyle Lowry or for Kyle Lowry to move on? Yeah, I would say so. Like you said, I think the best backcourt uh, the Raptors can put out there is um, to start the game is is Powell and Van Fleet. Um, Lowry's still good. I don't think he's he's done. It's just that given his contract, even though I know he's coming up on free agency, but given his contract you don't necessarily want to pay a guy that type of money on a losing team, especially to just sit back and, and watch Van Fleet take over. So if you can get something for him, I think uh, you move on from him. And there's teams, like I said, I don't think Lowry's done. He's still uh, productive and there's teams that could use him. I would say uh, the 76ers would be good for Lowry. Um, I would say the Clippers are probably another good destination for Lowry because the guy is tough. Um, he's still a tough defender. He can get to the hole. He can knock down the shot. In terms of the de- uh, defending, a little bit of extra flopping here and there from Lowry. Mm-hmm. But I like him. I think he's tough. I, I just think uh, it's Van Fleet's time to to start at the point guard instead of going with those two in the in the starting backcourt. Plus, besides that, um, he's in the G League now. But you have Malachi, uh, Malachi Flynn as well, who showed promise. Um, and like the, the early going of, of the G League. Um, so I would say, yeah, it's time to move on from Lowry. I don't think he's done. Um, but yeah, I would I would probably go with Van Fleet and Powell and, and get whatever I can for Lowry. <clears throat> Lowry's a good player. Um, I think his time was up in Toronto. You know, he's a, he's a legend out there. You know, um, they, they're kind of trying to rebuild, I guess. Um, Maybe he had the man would be a good fit for him. Move Luca to the two. Yeah. Let Luca have some break handling for handling um the basketball. Um Clippers are, of course. Um he'd probably be a good fit in Boston too. He's not really ball dominant. 
you know, and uh, I can see him in a corner spot. I don't think he's a better shooter than Kimber. Then again, I'm not quite sure. Maybe he's a better shooter from a spot-up position than Kimber. But Kimber, I guess, creates his own shot and pull up and, and score on you. But uh, Lowry is a good player. Is he enough to put team over the hump? Depends where he goes. Yeah. Clippers is a fair point. Dallas, um, I don't think so because KP6 is uh, health is an issue over there. But you put him on the Clippers, though, they got something going on. And he has chemistry with uh, Ibaka and, and Kawhi already, so why not? Yeah. The only thing, too, I'd like to add is that uh, I think if they do move on from Lowry, in my opinion, I think they need to do it respectfully because I kind of – the way they did DeMar DeRozan, I think it's a business. We get that. But the way they did him was a bit unfortunate, I think. So I don't think that franchise could afford to have another DeMar DeRozan type of situation on their hands. I think right. they have to find some way to to do it respectfully where um, it doesn't leave that taste in the fan base's mouth again, as well as Lowry's mouth, out of respect for him, I would say. Okay. But it is a business. Okay. So this week we're saying um, we had a, a team. We had the Nets with him affected by COVID-19. Katie had to miss the week. Um, for me, I, I learned a couple of things. That I, I, I learned that Katie is a bigger MVP candidate than what I thought because the other two guys are just not leaders or don't know what they're doing. So the first game they came out there, I was surprised to see that they lost to the Detroit Pistons with both of those guys playing. Then I guess the next game they lost, you, you had Kyrie proclaim that we need to do better, and then he stepped up and they won a game. So they basically went one and three without KD. For me, looking at the teams they faced and looking at the East, there's no way they should have lost that. They, they should have been able to – the teams that they particularly played weren't the top, you know, the top teams in the East. So they, they should have did a lot better considering they had they still had Joe Harris, you still have Harden, you still got Kyrie. I mean, you got Jeff Green. You have some players on there. They still should have did better than that. I mean, are, are the Nets, when I look at the Nets, listen, can the Nets survive any type of more COVID injuries or, or a loss to KD or, if God forbid, KD gets hurt or something? Could they survive? Yeah. Certainly doesn't look like it. And I think it goes back to even when KD is out there, I think it goes back to the defense. It's just KD's offense is that good where it makes up for the lack of defense. And now you lose those 30 points a game or whatever it is, and you're not playing no defense on top of it. Forget it, you know? I think it's it's a combination. I think they could afford to lose. You don't want them to lose anybody. I'm not advocating for anybody to get hurt or anything like that. But they could afford to lose, I would say, either or in terms of Kyrie and, and Harden. Um, but KD is definitely the guy they can afford to lose, I would say. Um, one thing I didn't like, too, uh, during during this time when KD was out, was Kyrie, again, made those comments about the team looks very average and, you know, it, from a leader perspective, you're supposed to be a leader. You you lose a couple of games. Granted, I understand you 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 want to win every game, but you lose a couple of games, and now you're in the media talking about the team looks very average. That's I think that's you know rubs your teammates the wrong way. If I'm on your team, and the first thing you do is go on the media and talk about how average we look, knowing that KD is out, you know that just rubs me the wrong way. Kyrie had a chance to prove that he was a leader, a can be a leader, and he failed. Point yeah. blank period. Yeah, good point. And Kyrie, Kyrie is what, what Kyrie is. He's self-centered, and uh, you know he could he could act like he's a, he's a he probably is a good teammate. I'm not gonna go that far. He probably is a good teammate, but as a leader, he's not a leader nowhere near it. Doesn't have the DNA whatsoever. I think James Harden would be a better leader than he will after uh, KD. But without KD, they are a non-playoff team, period. A certain team that they lost to, they should not have lost to because they were a the better talented team. You got Kyrie Hart in the backcourt. You playing against other other teams like the Cavaliers, again, or somebody else. You should be beating those teams. Right, yeah. The Wizards. You should be beating those yeah. teams without KD. You know, it wasn't like they was playing the top-tier teams. They was playing, you know, lower-tier teams and losing. 
I, I got to say this. I, I mean, I think, I think for one thing, I think they need to have a discussion because even without KD there, I don't know why James Harden just thinks he's supposed to take this back seat or roll. I don't want to see the 19 point James Harden. I don't want to see that guy no more, especially without KD there. Without KD there, I'm supposed to see 35 points. Yeah, we, we just, you know, they traded away the 19 point James Harden. His name is Karis Levert. Yeah. You wanted 19 points. You could have kept Karis Levert for a lot cheaper. Right. So you didn't bring Harden in for that. You brought him in to be Harden. And I wonder how much of that factors into Kyrie's, uh, like, his mindset, right? Is it one of those things where James Harden almost feels like he can't be himself because then Kyrie may feel some type of way? Or I wonder how much of it is that type of dynamic, too. But I, I want Harden out there shooting almost every – Every time down the court, you know, how many step backs has Harden taken since he's been on the Nets? I, I don't always see him doing it anymore. It's like this guy, he, he doesn't need There's to look no like way him. Harden should score 19 points when the team is scoring 130. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I would agree. The craziest thing is you watch the game and it seems like to me, I, to his credit, it seems like Joe Harris is more aggressive than, than James Harden. Yeah. It's, it's, it's strange. Yeah. It's no, it's no way. I mean, I, I think they just they don't have a have a real a real chance if these guys don't get it together. And I mean, right now, KD can't afford to miss a game, and that's going to be tough because even right. with coming off an injury, they're going to sit them out some games just for rest. So they need to figure that mm-hmm. out. And one thing, uh, another thing, as it pertains to the Nets, is um, there's rumors circulating that they are looking into possibly trading uh, Spencer Dinwiddie. Because I guess they they feel he may not sign back. Is he a free agent this summer or next summer? Uh, I'm quite I, sure. He's a good player. I'm not though. sure, but there's, yeah, there's rumors about them possibly looking into trading him out of concern that he may not want to be back. I, I think it's a good move. I think it's a real good move. You know why? Because I think that his value is really high, and that's probably the only way they're going to get a quality big one. And they said teams are, are are interested, even with him going down with the ACL injury, because the, the thought process is you get him in on your team now, even if he's a free agent at the end of the summer. Uh, bird right. Yeah, exactly. You bring him in and you could extend them for more money, assuming that, you know, you bring him into a situation and he seems to like the organization. So, like you said, that may be their, their way of leveraging getting the big man which is kind of crazy, too, because you look at the whole Jar- Jared Allen situation. I don't even know if they necessarily had to get rid of Jared Allen in order to uh, complete this Harden deal. So that was a little strange. Yeah, that was kind of strange to me. I, I didn't think that – I th- I'm, if anything, I mean, I think that those deals are personal deals because if I had to choose between Allen and Jordan, Jordan would have been the one in the deal. Yeah, I think he's he has some type of connection with KD and, and maybe Kyrie there. Um, but, yeah, they definitely need help uh, in terms of big men. They need defensive help all over the court. And we already noticed, like you said, that Kyrie, uh, KD, that is, can't afford to, to miss a game. I stay in severe trouble, which is troubling in itself, given that you supposedly have these uh, all-world superstars. If you have a big three and you can't beat Detroit when one of them are out, <laughs> you know, granted, anybody can lose on any given night, but to see Jeremy Grant going off for 30 something points, <laughs> Bay having career nights, you know, that's definitely concerning. And then, like you say, even with all of them out there, you have Cavaliers, right? Colin Sexton looking like prime Allen Iverson. So they definitely have some some concerns with the Nets for sure. Too many bad losses. So another, unfortunately, this week we lost um, Tom Konachowski to his name, a, a big time scout, provided a lot of opportunity for for New York area players and stuff, scouting and get them in good places. And I mean. I think he'll be sorely missed. I mean, what do you guys think? 
Yeah, for sure. Rest in peace. Um, top high school scout, like you said, of high school players, especially coming out of New York. So uh, big loss for sure. Yeah, I should see him a lot during the uh, game in Gaucho Gym. Never spoke to him, but I always see him in our same spot. He always stood out, very tall guy, very accurate with, with, with his evaluation of players. I read a lot of his articles and a lot of um, high school magazines, like I guess, like Blue Ribbon Report, Stan Smith, or Stan, uh, Street Smith, I should say, back in the days, years ago, I used to buy those magazines. He always had an article, full page of uh, very good info on anybody across the world, especially in New York City, by the way. Uh, he will be missed in the uh, high school community. Yeah, I, I think I think you know, especially now the way New York football is, I don't think that we have enough people actually scouting our kids and giving them that type of look as we used to. We used to have like a real good. Yeah, at one point New York was turning out point guards all over the country. I mean, you'd have Bobby Crimmins in that George in that um, gym all the time. That's how he ended up with Steph Kenny M. I mean, we had yeah, it was the golden day. Right. And now, you know, it's going to be tough. So we, we, could, we could definitely have used that. Hopefully we get somebody in this area to fill our shoes. It would happen. Yeah, agreed. So, I just want to talk about one last thing. This week, Dustin Pedroia retired after, him after a 15-year career. I mean, I look looking at him, but I mean, if he's a model of consistency at the position, put up good numbers throughout his career. Or something. I, I mean, I think I think the game will miss him or something. I know the last couple of years, he a lot of injuries and was hurt. And he tried to make one last push, and it just didn't, didn't work out for him. Yeah, I, I would agree. Um, I think it's time for him to, to retire. I think he had a great career. You know, being a Yankees fan, you know, always gone against them, so to speak, right, with, with Boston. So that was fun to watch. Um, but, yeah, I think it was time for him to hang it up just based on injuries. But a guy, like you said, had, had a hell of a career, you know, a hell of a player, I would say. Yeah, three-time champion, like a four-time All-Star, a definite New York Yankee killer. Do not get it twisted. Yeah. <laughs> For sure. Very good player. Um, if he goes to Hall of Fame, I wouldn't be mad at it at all. No. You know, I'm not mad at it at all. But um, definitely a good player, for sure, without question. He was always one of those guys that I just because he was a Yankee killer, I wouldn't have mind seeing him in, in pinstripes, kind of like the whole Jacoby Ellsbury thing. Yeah. Like, we need to bring this guy over here. Right. <laughs> I think we ended up getting Ellsbury. And unfortunately, he was kind of like already at that point where Droy is now. Yeah. Uh, where he was a bit injury prone and stuff like that. But. I always wanted uh, Pedroia to be in, in pinstripes just because he was Yankee killer. Uh, I, I'm right there with you. <laughs> but one last thing I want to go over. I just seen it flash by. Um, we have a Matt Harvey signing. Matt Harvey signed a minor league deal for Baltimore Orioles. I mean, I will say this. I mean, the uh, Matt Harvey, listen, I think part of his thing is that after that stretch in the playoffs, he's never seen the fight be the same. And I think they might have overworked his arm. He might have pitched too many innings. Well, we definitely know in one game he pitched too many innings. <laughs> but I think that his sight, he's never been the same. I mean, do you think Matt Harvey can stop the down there in Baltimore? I think he's, uh, like you said, I think that postseason probably killed him killed his arm. So I think he's probably done. Um, but to see him get another shot, if that's what he's looking to do, isn't a bad a bad thing. But I think he's probably done. Yeah, he's done. But I think <laughs> Orioles, when I, when I kick the tire, so to speak, you know, it can't hurt. But he's yeah. definitely done. Agreed, yeah. 
So again, guys, what's him? I thank you guys for coming on. What's him? As always, enjoy talking to you guys, talking about sports. What's him? Reem, you got any final words for this week? Uh, just my usual. It's, it's a pleasure being here with you guys to talk sports. Fortunate to be able to do it for another week, um, given what's going on in the world today. So um, just blessed to be here and, and be able to uh, talk sports. Uh, I have two things to say, fellas. Yankee signed Jay Bruce to minor league deal. I nice. am mad at that. And at the same time last year, Brady, Fournette, Gronk, and uh, AB was not in the NFL. Nice. Nice. That's a good one. One was a wrestler. Yeah. One was in jail. <laughs> one got cut. One was a free agent. A year later, nice. it's the Bowl champions. Only in sports, nice. man. Only in Only sports. sports. And I, I just got a final word. Everybody's everybody's getting discredited them or not giving them credit they serve. Utah Jazz just keep winning those games, and we're saying San Antonio Spurs creeping up, beating up on teams, beating up on big teams. So let's keep your eye on them. That's true. Yeah, that's true. Well said. But thanks again, guys. Have a great night. Always enjoy, fellas, man. Enjoy. Later. 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 Later.